We are hearing mixed messages as to whether the president himself is the subject of an investigation in the ongoing probe of Russian meddling in the 2016 presidential race. After reports that special counsel Robert Mueller was investigating Mr. Trump for obstruction of justice, the president tweeted on Friday, I am being investigated for firing the FBI director by the man who told me to fire the FBI director. Witch hunt. But that's not what the president's private lawyer is saying. Attorney Jay Sekulow went on multiple shows, including Face the Nation, to deny the president is under investigation. The president issued that tweet on social media because of the report in The Washington Post from five anonymous sources, none of which, of course, anyone knows about, alleging that the president was under investigation in this purported expanded probe. The fact of the matter is the president has not been and is not under investigation. How do you know? Because we've received no notice of investigation. There's been no notification uh, from the special counsel's office that the president is under investigation. Washington Post congressional reporter Sean Sullivan is joining us now in, from Washington. Sean, so what do you make of the mixed messages and the fact that we only heard from the president's attorney and not a member of his actual administration? Well, this is the latest example of the president's words being at odds with his defenders, with his aides, with his allies. We've seen this time and again during this administration. Uh, as you pointed out, the president did pretty unequivocally say that he was being investigated in his tweet from last week. Uh, the Post and others have reported that. And when you listen to the words of his lawyer yesterday, he doesn't seem to fully explain why the president tweeted what he did about being investigated and also said he couldn't be 100 percent certain that he wasn't being investigated, even though they have not received any notice. So what the president's team is doing here is really causing more confusion and raising more questions about a situation that they really don't want to be dealing with right now. You know, they'd rather be talking about health care and tax reform and other issues. But this continues to be a distracting cloud that hovers over the president and his agenda right now. Creating sort of that chaos and that confusion. We've seen it before. Could this actually be part of the president's strategy? Uh, perhaps that's a possibility, but you know, there is also a downside to doing something like that, which is you have, you know, differing conclusions being drawn by different members of the president's team, different members of the administration. This could lead to more questions if there are more hearings on Capitol Hill. Um, we've already seen, you know, Jeff Sessions. We've already seen James Comey testify up there. So if there are more of these types of hearings, we might see more questions raised about what did the president actually say? What is actually happening? I think there's a lot of confusion about this. And it makes it harder for Republicans on Capitol Hill to defend him because they often don't know what is the official line. What are they defending? You mentioned Republicans on Capitol Hill. Let's go to health care now. Democrats are threatening to block Senate business in response to Republican senators working behind closed doors to draft that replacement health care bill. How close are we right now to getting something on health care from the Senate? Well, I think we might be pretty close. The question is, are the votes going to be there for Republicans? And when you talk about what Democrats are doing to sort of stage these protests against the bill, these are mostly symbolic gestures because they can't stop the Republicans from passing this bill if the Republicans get at least 50 out of 52 of themselves together and vote for this thing. So the Democrats don't have the vote to do that. And what they're going to do is they're going to give speeches on the floor. They're going to do things that they hope will attract attention, you know, maybe late into the evening tonight. They're going to try to obstruct other parts of the Republican agenda. But the reality is this comes down to Mitch McConnell and whether he can get 50 out of 52 Republican senators to vote for this bill. I think there has been a lot of work behind the scenes in this bill. McConnell and a very small clutch of aides have been crafting this bill. Uh, it's been a pretty secretive process, and that's frustrated not just Democrats, but also Republicans. Uh, so I think they are close to having something, but whether or not we'll actually see that, whether or not they'll actually bring that to a vote depends on whether McConnell thinks he can get enough votes to pass it, because if he can't, it would be a huge embarrassment for him, and I don't think that's something that he wants to go through. Yeah, and he had originally said that he wanted this by July 4th. Do you think we're, we're seeing that? That's next week already. We're just over a week away. It is just over a week away, and when I checked in with Republicans uh, who are familiar with this process late last week, they said, yes, this is still the goal. We are still trying to push this thing ahead so we can bring this to the Senate floor next week, 
go through the process of amendments and other things and then get to a final vote before the 4th of July recess. But again, it's the agreement, or I should say the lack of agreement, that's really holding this thing up. Um, you know, there's plenty of time to pass this thing and get this thing through, but the question is, can enough Republicans agree on this framework? And there's been so many disagreements on Medicaid, on some of the regulations and some of the taxes that it's been very difficult for McConnell to write a bill that satisfies enough people to vote for this. So we are really getting down to the wire here, and it still remains to be seen whether these votes are going to be there for McConnell and whether he can even bring this thing to the floor next week as he wants to do. Well, tomorrow, Georgia will have voters going to the polls for a special election. Democrat John Ossoff, Republican Karen Handel, competing to fill Tom Price's vacant House seat. Dems have spent a lot of money here. This has been a Republican stronghold for decades. Can the Democrats really pull this out? It, it looks like it's a tight enough race that they might be able to uh, at the same time. Republicans might be able to win this. So this is a competitive race for sure and one that has implications, uh, you know, in the here and now when we talk about health care and tax reform. If Republicans lose this seat, you know, it might prompt a lot of nervousness in the Republican Party. Hold on a second. You know, voters are um, not happy with the agenda we're putting forth. They're not happy with the performance of the president and the Congress right now. It might start to cause some panic in Republican circles. At the same time, if they are able to win this, if they're able to hold this seat, it's going to cause even more frustration among Democrats because they see a lot of energy. They see a lot of, you know, uh, desire in their voters to get out, to be active, to vote against the Republican agenda. But if they can't win this race, you know, this is another in a series of special elections where they've tried to compete. And if they come up empty again, it's going to cause even more frustration in the Democratic Party. And people are going to start to wonder, where are the Democrats actually going to win? And where, when are they actually going to win? They, they talk about all this energy. But if they can't actually win one of these races, I think that's going to be pretty troubling to a lot of Democrats. Yeah, we were just saying the same type of thing in Montana. And maybe here the focus is, is a little bit different. But is there any sense that from Democrats, um, I don't know, it's a moral victory, any kind of victory, if they even get close? Again, it's been four decades that Republicans have controlled this seat. Yeah, I think if they do get close but ultimately fall short, they'll point to a few things. One, that there is enthusiasm because they raised a lot of money and a lot of people from around the country gave to this Democratic candidate. Uh, number two, as you said, you know, this is not normally fertile Democratic territory. And they can say, look, there are other districts that are more favorable to us that we can win next year in the midterms. But you've got to look at this situation. And as you said, we talked about Montana, you know. If you're the Democrats right now, you need a win. You know, you look back all the way to 2016, a lot of people thought Hillary Clinton was going to win and be president right now. She didn't. A lot of people thought Democrats would control the Senate and win that majority. They didn't. They are really, really hungry right now for a win, and they need to show their base. Look, if you stick with this, if you turn out, if you vote, if you volunteer, if you give money, we can produce these victories. And so far, they have not produced a single one. Sean Sullivan from The Washington Post. Sean, thank you. We appreciate the time. My pleasure.